Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian. I am here today at Beretta's Reference Museum through their generosity. I'm taking a look at a number of uh, experimental semi-auto rifles that they have. And today we're going to take a look at two because they're very similar, although they're different models. This is a model 1931 and a model 1937 Beretta semi-auto. So some of the guns they have here were actually developed by Beretta, some were developed by other people, and are simply here as part of a reference collection. These are both Beretta-made, Beretta-designed guns. My understanding is they were both uh, the brainchild, well, it's really one design that they modified, and my understanding is it's the brainchild of Tullio Marangoni, who was the also the developer behind Beretta's line of semi-automatic pistols. He was really one of their main development engineers spent a long time here and had quite the illustrious career. Now, the Italian military was looking for a self-loading rifle, as were most militaries in the 1930s, and they experimented with a bunch of different designs. Now, what Marangoni came up with was a short recoil action semi-automatic rifle. So we have a rotating bolt, it locks, it has six uh, locking lugs on the front, and when I say short recoil, what I mean is that when you fire, the entire barrel and receiver, well, the barrel and the locking section, cycle back about a quarter inch, eight millimeters, maybe 10 millimeters, like that. You'll notice when this goes back, when it's all the way to the rear, the bolt is cammed up slightly. That's unlocked, and once it's unlocked like this, it can then cycle backwards to extract and eject the empty case and load a new one. This is actually kind of like the, uh, the 1941 Johnson rifle, although this predated the Johnson substantially. Now, these two rifles look a bit different, and they are a bit different, although they're the same mechanism. The basic difference here is this is the 1931 pattern gun. This is, in fact, serial number one, dated 1931. And this rifle is in 6.5 Carcano, and it uses the standard six round Carcano and block clip. This was Marangoni's first development. Well, six years later, the Italian army had started working with some other ideas. They developed a 7.35 millimeter cartridge. Uh, they thought that the 6.5 wasn't really big enough. They wanted to go to a 7.35 instead to give the cartridge a little bit more oomph. So Marangoni redesigned the gun slightly, and we get this, which is the same basic action, but in 7.35 millimeter. Now, he made a number of other changes. Uh, a couple extra features to the mechanism. Interestingly, the adjustable rear sight was replaced with a fixed sight that's similar to what we would see on the Carcano bolt action rifles um, at this same time period. Uh, the 735 carbines had fixed sights on them instead of the adjustable sights on the earlier 6.5 guns. To me, that's a change that makes sense. It's a lot simpler, and for troops in the field, the need for an adjustable sight that goes out to 1,500 meters is really, I think, pretty, uh, pretty unnecessary. Uh, when you go to a fixed site, it's less things to break, it's cheaper to make, uh, it's also fewer things that a soldier can mess up by adjusting. You know? So, at any rate, um, let's take a look at both of these uh, in detail. We'll start with the older one, and then we'll take a look at the Model 37. All right, starting with the model of 1931, we have here Pietro Beretta, Gardone, Via Trompia, 1931, serial number one, and there's the date again. You'll notice this has the same rear sight as the early 6.5 Carcanos. Uh, by the way, this cutout is supposed to be there because your battle sight has this piece all the way flipped forward. So you use this rear sight, and that's why there's a cutout in the handguard. All right, so moving to the front, we have a fairly heavy finned barrel to improve cooling, and then it's got a what looks like a brass uh, sleeve that it actually rides in, so that as the barrel cycles back and forth, like so. You want to make sure that the barrel isn't, uh, well, you want one replaceable part here in this system of moving parts. By using brass, you ensure that the brass takes all the wear, 
and if the brass uh, gets too worn, you can replace it and you don't have to worry about the barrel or the stock attachment um, being worn out of spec. Now, when we look at the action, of course, we can see that recoiling system right there. This cam track right here is what pushes the bolt open. Once it's unlocked in this position, then it can cycle back. Now, on this gun, you'll notice there's no space to load from the top. This used a standard six round Carcano clip and kind of like the French 1917 and 1918 rifles, you would load it from the bottom. So you'd put a clip in there, close this, you've got your follower spring there. There's a hole in the bottom of the magazine. So when the clip, when you chamber the last round, the clip is going to fall out the bottom there. We have a safety here on the side. That's the fire position. Um, moving all the way back is safe, which it won't do when the bolt's open. This is our bolt release. We would use that to drop the bolt forward, which actually we need to do. There's that. It rotates down into position uh, to lock. And then we do also have a little dust cover right there. And the back or the front of the dust cover is curved so that when you cycle the bolt, it automatically opens the dust cover. Pretty slick. Now, there's a really weird hammer firing system in here, which we'll get to. I will take apart the Model 37 to show you that. So let's move over to the 37. All right, I mentioned the change of the rear sight here to a fixed one. Now we still have a recoiling system like that. However, something has been added to it. There is now an A and an R position. Actually, I should point out first the receiver markings here. Pietro Beretta, Gardone, Via Trompia. Now this one is model of 1937. That XV is the 15th year of uh, Mussolini's regime. So it started in 1922. Now what they've added here is a way to disengage or disable the semi-automatic function and turn this into a manual bolt action rifle. You can see that there are lugs right here on the barrel assembly and those cycle back. What this piece does is rotate and allow you to lock those lugs out of alignment. So now there's no space for those lugs to move into. And when I push on the end of the barrel, this can't go anywhere. So this is bolt action mode. I can still cycle the bolt by hand and I can still fire, but it doesn't cycle automatically. If I want to do that, I have to push this tab forward and rotate that back down into the automatico position. Now looking at the bottom, we can see there's no longer a hole in the bottom. We have a Mauser style of floor plate and on top we now have a stripper clip guide. Now the best information I have says that this was a nine round internal magazine with a special stripper clip. Um, they don't have one of the clips here available so I have no idea. I don't have one to show you. It seems a little bit odd that they would do nine rounds instead of ten. Ten, of course, could use a pair of five round clips. On the other hand, the Italian military didn't have any tradition of five round clips because all the way back to 1891, they had been using six round and block clips. So maybe nine, I guess, makes sense. Uh, logistically, maybe that's easier to deal with if you've been doing six and now you have nine. I don't know. All I can do is speculate there. Um, the bolt release is gone here. We now have it built into the ejector. So I push that in. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, drop the follower in order to let the bolt home, like so. Now to take this apart, oh, one last bit. Up here at the muzzle, we now have this metal um, sort of handguard that I suspect would get rather hot. You want to hold on to this back here on the wood. We still have a brass um, sleeve that the barrel cycles back and forth in, like so. Uh, but they've gotten rid of the cooling fins. A lot of things were done to make this gun a little bit less expensive. So no cooling fins. Um, and then it also kind of matches the general pattern of Italian development where 
it's a little bit shorter. Um, this is like the, the short rifle length instead of a little bit in between a carbine and a long rifle. All right, now for disassembly, I'm gonna start by locking the safety on so that I don't inadvertently drop the hammer. And then I need to unscrew this rear receiver plug. So it's locked in place until I hit the ejector button, which allows me to unscrew it. Uh, Tulio Marangoni was also responsible for the Beretta 38 through 44 series of submachine guns, and they also had a tubular receiver design like this. All right, that's going to give us this receiver end cap, mainspring guide, and mainspring. Then I can pull this sheet metal dust cover off. Again, this is really thin and feels quite delicate. Then the bolt simply slides out the back. All right, here is our bolt and inside it, we have a rather odd looking firing pin assembly. This has its own uh, spring. This is the firing pin spring. This prevents it from going forward and firing when the bolt closes. That's just a, uh, basically a, well, yeah, prevents it from firing when the bolt closes. Now you can see that that is keyed right there. We have a matching keyway here. The way that works, that slides in right there. And then the firing pin is actually under spring tension like that. And this is hammer fired. So I'll show you the hammer in a moment, but the center hole in the bolt is for the mainspring. And then this lug on the bottom both guides the firing pin itself and is also what the hammer hits. So when the hammer hits it, it goes in like that against spring pressure. And you can see that the firing pin protrudes there. Now, when the bolt's not fully in battery, the firing pin is held down here where you can see that it does not come all the way forward because it's under, so that, that firing pin spring is doing, doing two jobs. It's preventing it from uh, firing under inertia by going forward. It's also pulling the firing pin well, from this direction counterclockwise, which means as soon as the bolt's in battery, the firing pin is going to want to be in this firing position where it can protrude through like that. So really an unusual system, but one that appears to work. Um, it's a little finicky to put this back in the gun because you have to make sure that this is held in this position to go into the receiver while also depressing the, the, the magazine follower and pushing forward on the bolt handle. So I mentioned it's hammer fired. You can see the hammer right down there. It's this big curved surface because it actually has to miss the mainspring and just hit the bottom of that firing pin insert. This guy is our ejector. It's spring loaded and it's held out of the way until the bolt opens fully, then it kicks open. All right, now to put this back in, we've got our firing pin in the bolt. So I'm gonna line this up, line up the bolt handle in its track, and then we've got a second track down here for the firing pin lug. But first, we have to depress the follower. Then I come over here and push the firing pin over. Now it's in its lug. Now we hit the follower again. That goes forward and now it's in battery. Now I should point out that firing pin spring is really quite cleverly done because it is pushing the firing pin into position to fire and it's also providing the motive force to push the bolt into battery um, because it's pushing, it's a rotational spring because it's being wound rotationally. So, slick. This gun seems awfully complicated at first but the closer you look at it, uh, the more interesting and clever it gets. Tulio Marangoni was a smart dude. Put that on. And then all I have to do is get the recoil spring inside the bolt there. And this threads right on the back. 
All right, one last look across here at the model of, again, this is the model of 37. So this is in 735 millimeter. It's a little bit shorter, has that fixed, uh, probably nine round magazine. On the bottom here, we've got a bayonet lug. We've got a cutout for a cleaning rod, although the rod is not present on this one. You can see our Mauser style floor plate there. And of course the Italian style of sling swivel. There's our ejector and also the release to unthread the re rear of the receiver cap. There is our our control for switching to manual mode. This interesting metal handguard in the front and the barrel. And our last pan across the model of 31. So this is the 635 millimeter version. We've got a magazine set up to take standard six round Carcano clips. We've got the old style of Carcano adjustable rear sight, bayonet lug, the muzzle. Again, the bayonet lug and a cleaning rod cutout with no cleaning rod present on this one. The bottom of our magazine slash clip well. Side mounted sling swivel. Oh, we didn't look at that before. A nice big old Beretta Gardone proof mark and serial number one on the stock. This one, of course, has the bolt release on the opposite side of the receiver tube. So this, and that doubles as the release to allow you to unthread the rear cap. This is just our ejector housing. Thank you for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. This was a fantastic opportunity to take a look at a couple of these extremely rare prototype rifles from Beretta. I'm very grateful to Beretta for allowing me to come in here and take a look at these and bring them to you guys. If you enjoy this sort of content, please consider checking out my Patreon page and uh, joining to help support my work if you like it. That's uh, my main source of funding that allows me to do things like travel to Italy to show you guys cool stuff like this. Anyway, Tune back into Forgotten Weapons for more early self-loading rifles. Thanks for watching.